Welcome back to Variant Quran. I'm Dr. Daniel Brubaker. Some of you have wondered whether Yasser Qadi sent me a reply to the email that I showed you about a week ago, and indeed he did. So um, stick around until the end. We're going to talk about that a little bit, and then I'll show you uh, his reply to me and then my subsequent reply to him. All right, well, let's just jump right in. And uh, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time dealing with uh, criticisms and things like that, because um, really, I don't think they need to have a whole lot of time spent on them. But um, every now and then you do need to answer some of these things. And uh, some of this stuff has been swirling around and repeated. And the criticisms that Yasser Qadi uh, made of me are recycled to, to, to a large extent and come have been uh, circulated around by some other um, other people as well. So my response is a little bit uh, more general in nature. I want to answer these things a little bit and then move on to other stuff because really I have uh, other work to do and don't need to be uh, um, distracted by these things. All right, let's um, go into the, um, the substance. Now, um, when he um, made his um, video uh, the day before Thanksgiving, <clears throat> last week. Oh, what was that? That was the week before last. Well, he criticized uh, me. He put me in with uh, uh, two other uh, gentlemen, David Wood and um, Jay Smith. Um, I think trying to um, throw me into a category uh, with uh, some folks who are doing, which I don't disrespect what they're doing at uh, in the least, but to uh, throw me into a category of apologists and polemicists. And I think that that was, uh, well, I, I I can imagine it looks to be intentional to, to me to try and characterize me in a particular way. And um, that fits also with some of the other uh, things and the way that he has leveled to criticisms, which are largely ad hominem uh, criticisms of me. So I just want you to notice uh, that aspect of it. But um, okay, so let's jump into the main uh, things that he says. Um, and I'm doing this from memory, but uh, he criticizes um, pulling from a parody account, parody Twitter account, that is, uh, by the way, in an unauthorized way, reproducing and reprinting my um, excerpts from my doctoral dissertation. Uh, but be that as it may, it's out there and, uh, and they're doing it. Uh, that's another matter. But uh, somebody went and found, obviously combed through my entire doctoral dissertation and picked out the places where they found uh, some mistakes in it. It wouldn't be surprising that there would be mistakes. There are mistakes in every doctoral dissertation. And uh, probably, uh, maybe there are one or two that don't have any mistakes, but um, but that uh, that is what it is. So uh, I've been aware of a number of these things for um, a while. Well, I've been aware of one of them for a while. The other one um, is something that is a little bit odd, but uh, I do want to point out what is what Yasser Kadi was criticizing. He was criticizing uh, in one instance um, the and and others have been criticizing, uh, saying that I don't know Arabic or some variation of not knowing Arabic or not being good in Arabic or whatever. There are a couple things I want to say to that. Uh, one of them being I could not have gotten to where I am. Uh, number one successfully defending my doctorate um, to the satisfaction of my examiners. Um, number two, even completing the work that I did without knowing Arabic um, to the sufficient level and of the type of Arabic that I needed to know in order to do this work. And so it's absurd, actually, really, to be saying that I don't know Arabic. I think you all have seen this um, uh, this YouTube channel, and you've seen that I have uh, the ability to move around in Arabic. I don't even know why I'm talking about it, because it's, uh, you know, it should be patently obvious. Now, um, you can criticize pronunciation, you can criticize uh, grammar, and, um, um, you know, I accept any valid criticism, and uh, some of those criticisms of, uh, of uh, oh, you, you know, didn't um, properly parse this, or or you didn't make the most preferable word choice in translation, or maybe you got a translation wrong. Those are things that you know I'm not going to argue if they're uh, if they're true and valid. But but the larger point behind that is this: that in some ways uh, it is really a distraction from the it's a smokescreen from uh, from the main point. Behind my work is is really and really what my work what has been is to um, review thousands of pages 
thousands, tens of thousands, actually. Now, well, probably about 10,000 pages, more than 10,000 pages now of early Quran manuscripts and locate and describe corrections, physical corrections that exist in them. And so um, if you come down and you look at the substance of the work and the fact of a correction, you can, you can do a couple of different things. You can say that wasn't really a correction. Um, you can say that was a mistake, which some people have uh, tried to say, and some of them I've freely admitted are, are likely mistakes. I don't believe they're all mistakes, but uh, some people have tried to um, suggest that everything is a mistake and that, ex that is the full explanation for all of these. I don't think that's the case, but of course people can argue um, whatever um, they wish on that and they should do so from uh, considering the evidence, I think, and, and looking at the, each thing on a case-by-case -case basis. But but you have this situation of a correction in, a, in an early Quran manuscript. Number one, either it is or is not accurately described. There is a either a correction there or not. That's number one. Did I see what was on the page? Is it, in fact, something that was done after the initial production of the page? Uh, number two, did I correctly identify the uh, the verse that it exists in? Did I number three, did I correctly identify the the rasam, the portion of the rasam that was affected, and so forth? And so far, I've not seen. I don't think I've seen anybody um, who has found an error in my identification of a portion of rasam that has been uh, corrected. Number one, identifying which verse it is. Number two, identifying what portion of Rasam, and number three, that there is in fact a a, um, a correction or in some cases a variant in a manuscript. And so this is this is really what I do. So I just want you to know that all the other stuff about uh, oh you didn't choose the right word or or that's a ridiculous translation or or whatever that's important. All these things are important. Details are very important. But I just want you to recognize that that is sort of a sideshow to the main thing, which is the um, the existence. Uh, of these things and trying to get our heads around what the meaning of these things in the manuscripts are. And I don't blame, I do understand apologists and polemicists on all sides who uh, are trying to win points and so forth, and I understand that Yasser Qadi is trying to win points and trying to uh, create an impression of uh, somebody like myself who's doing research and, and sort of knock me off uh, as an authority, as somebody to be listened to, because the substance of what I'm doing is um, is potentially disrupting of people's uh, worldview and and uh, and the things that they uh, believe and hold dear and so forth. I don't, you know, I, I'm sympathetic to that. I, I understand it. I just want to point out that it is uh, an attack on the person, and uh, usually an ad hominem attack comes when there's no, uh, when somebody realizes that there's no um, substantive way of winning the argument, and I'm not really arguing with anyone, but you don't come and, uh, uh, for example, if somebody wanted to say or to debunk, some people have thrown, thrown around the word debunk. If you wanted to debunk my work, you would come and say, no, Brubaker is wrong. There's not really a correction in that manuscript. He's uh, incorrect in noting that there's something there. Or you would say, no, this is clearly a mistake. Now, some people have tried to do that, and that's that's fine. And you can say in each individual case, this is clearly just a scribal mistake, and there's nothing to see here. And, um, you know, you can try to do that. But to come and do these things of saying, you shouldn't listen to Rubaker because he doesn't know what he's talking about because he doesn't know Arabic, um, that is, um, I think that's uh, that's just smoke and mirrors. So, um, you can make of that what you want, but uh, that is my response to that. Now, let's see, what else did he, um, what else did he say? It was the Arabic issue. Yeah, it was really, it was the translation, and, well, I think that might be, uh, that might be the substance of what he, uh, what he, what he dealt with. And by the way, um, I, an interesting thing, I was, uh, just presented my paper, not my best paper, actually. Um, frankly, I didn't feel that too good about my presentation, but uh, last year's was very good at the International Chronic Studies Association. Uh, this year, we were all on Zoom because of the uh, the virus situation. And so, anyway, my panel, uh, the interesting thing about that that you may not have realized or known is that uh, I'm told Yasser Khadi was originally on my panel. 
and was uh, meant to be giving a paper alongside me. And for some reason, um, he uh, did not wind up being on that panel. And I don't know what happened. Although I do um, recognize that the events of this summer intervened probably between the time that we all presented our paper proposals and and obviously the time of presenting. So I don't know if that had anything to do with it. Uh, I do you know, feel sympathetic to um, to him. And uh, yes, sir, if you're listening to this, I don't, you know, I, I, uh, I think you were um, honest, even if your words were uh, misinterpreted by some, I think that the statement that you made in that interview was honest. And I saw you uh, um, <clears throat> uh, wanting to be as tactful uh, and protective of people as possible while also being honest. And I respected that when I saw it. And, um, and I, you know, I, I don't, um, I don't, I didn't take any joy in seeing, uh, the, um, uh, fury from all sides coming down on, on you for that. But, um, at any rate, uh, yeah, uh, Yasser Kadi was meant to be on the panel that I was presenting on, and I was alongside Marin Van Putin, um, Haitham Sidki, and, um, the discussants for the panel were uh, Alba Fideli and Shadni Nasser. So that was a very good uh, group of people. Um, our very own Asma Hilali, Dr. Asma Hilali was uh, his current president of the International Chronic Studies Association, and she gave the presidential address, which I missed, but um, I did correspond with her afterwards, and she kindly sent me a copy of um, of her prepared paper for that, so I was able to read it and, uh, and look at that. So these things are going on in the background uh, in the academic world, and, uh, you know, I'm immersed in it, and I'll be giving you little snippets and uh, and views into that world uh, from time to time. Yeah, so let's uh, let's go in now. I just uh, want to wrap this up with letting you see the follow-up correspondence that I had with uh, Yasser Kadi. I think it's okay to share this because it is a um, it is a uh, issue of public interest. And um, um, and again, uh, Yasser, if you ever want me to, uh, I will respect. You know, if you ever want to have a private communication with me, just just note it in your email. I'll respect that. But um, so here is the. Uh, email that uh, Yasser sent back to me. He says, Dan, as I said in the video, I have nothing against you as a person. Apologies for saying David accidentally, as I was just talking about David Wood, and that slipped out. I am in general a very amicable person, I would like to think. I am also very frank and don't believe in double talk. Not only am I not impressed with what I've read from you, for me, the main point that I find problematic is that you seem to be agenda-driven. Okay, I want to talk about these things as we as we go through them. I um, rather than just uh, reading the whole email and coming back at them. But it's very good to not believe in double talk and uh, and want to be straightforward in what we say. That's a, that's a good thing. We don't want to be two-faced in our presentation to the world. Tactful is one thing, but uh, two-faced is uh, is something that's not generally so good. He says he's not impressed with what he's read from me, and that's fine. He can be impressed or not be impressed, that's fine. The main point that I find problematic is that you seem to be agenda-driven. Well, and he continues on to say, I understand my biases as a Muslim and hence always try my best when I give academic talks to put myself in as neutral of a position as possible. And um, that's great. I mean, that's that's what we all try to do. You know, the fact of the matter is that everyone uh, in doing scholarly work or otherwise has uh, biases. We all have biases. Uh, it's very good that uh, Yasser Qadhi recognizes his biases as a Muslim when he's doing academic work. We have to do those in religious studies. In my uh, area of religious studies, you, you bracket your beliefs. You sort of, you recognize that they're there. You don't let go of them or say that you don't believe them, but you sort of, as a methodology, you set them aside while you consider the question in front of you and, and you look at it and think about it. And uh, it's good that he does that. And by the way, it's what I do as well. And I recognize that as a Christian, I have things that I believe in. I recognize that I have premises that are uh, foundational for me, that I operate and uh, see the world through. But I also, as a trained scientist and, well, as, a, as an honest person, um, my undergraduate degree, uh, one of them is cell and molecular biology. And so I understand scientific, scientific method. And I'm going to do a a video coming up on what is science coming up soon. But you want to recognize what things can be empirically proven, meaning they can rest on uh, actually uh, observations of the world. And, and those things are part of physical reality. Usually physical reality can be measured. Now, the thing about, um, about reality is that there are some aspects of reality. I think it would be absurd to believe that there are not 
aspects of reality that we cannot measure and cannot perceive. In the same way that um, certain animals don't have the ability to, for example, to see color. It doesn't mean that color doesn't exist. Well, actually, color doesn't exist. It's uh, it's wavelengths that we perceive as color. But, um, but the point is that um, our perceptions and our senses are limited. And beyond that, the idea that there is reality beyond what is physical is, uh, I think, a very reasonable proposition. Now, determining what that reality, the, the problem is that that reality is beyond the reach of science. And so these premises are things that we have to either arrive at by the use of reason, and reason can be powerful in this regard, or we arrive at them by pure faith. And so, uh, and sometimes a combination of both. But those are things that are outside. And so we have to recognize we can use these in our view of the world, but we also have these this empirical data over here. So most of the time when we're doing scientific work, we're working with empirical data, whether it's, you know, history is a little bit difficult because none of us are going to be eyewitnesses to events a thousand years ago, <laughs> much less, you know, even in the same way, we're not even going to be witnesses to events that are more than a mile away from us at any given time. We have to rely on eyewitness accounts of what happens in the world and what has happened in the past in the world. So there's all this, but then when we come back to the manuscripts and to other objects such as coins and inscriptions and things like that. We have witnesses. We have uh, tangible evidence of something that happened in the past. So that is also what we're doing. All right. So Yasser Qadi understands his biases as Muslim. I understand my biases as a Christian. I have uh, never hidden the fact that I'm, uh, that I'm a Christian. Um, I try to operate in an honest way and uh, to participate in discussions freely and openly, but, but uh, not to try and um, press some particular uh, agenda. This this question, this, this word agenda is curious to me because I don't know in what way he means agenda driven, unless he perhaps means by the very fact that I've chosen the topic that I did. And I don't know uh, whether it bears mention, but obviously I chose a topic that was number one, interesting to me. Number two, that I thought was important. You know, the question of whether the uh, Quran that has reached us is in fact the Quran that, was, that existed uh, at the time of Muhammad and that he, uh, according to tradition, delivered to, uh, to to his people. It's a really important question. It's a very important question. And it may be that what we have now is a faithful representation of that. But as academics and as scientists, we uh, we can't assume that from the start, no matter what we, you know, I may be inclined to believe that or not believe that. As a Christian, I may be inclined to believe that. Many Christians are inclined to believe the traditional account about the uh, transmission of the Quran, and many Christians are inclined not to. And uh, but most Muslims, of course, are inclined to believe it, and um, and that's fine. You can believe whatever you want, but when we're operating, we need to put those things on over on this side, and we need to operate in the realm of the pursuit of truth. And the and truth, what is truth? Truth is what is. It, it's the uh, it, it's what exists in the world as it is, and that's what we're after. So that's kind of a long and roundabout way of saying it. But let's continue with uh, Yasser Qadi's. Uh, reply to me. Uh, he says, I understand when I make theolog a theological assumption and when I don't. Okay, great. I also understand when I make a theological assumption and when I don't. I don't think I make any too many theological assumptions in applying to my academic work. He says, in your case, I find it very repugnant that you are spoon-feeding well-known Islamophobes and Christian apologists who lack both genuine knowledge and integrity. Now, this is really an important aspect of this letter because, uh, well, spoon-feeding, I'm not sure what that means, except maybe that I'm uh, my uh, material is being made available, but it's already published in, in, in a book and, and I'm, it's out in other um, places uh, and so forth. It's out there to be discussed. So I don't know what spoon feeding means, except perhaps that I'm having conversations and making myself available selectively to interviews and things like that. And I haven't said yes to that many interviews with, uh, with folks. But this word Islamophobe, I just want to mention that for a moment and to point out the uh, what that word is. And I've given a talk about this that I would like to actually redo at the Westminster Institute because uh, I don't feel that I said it quite as well as I, uh, as I could have. And uh, so I'd like to redo that talk one day. But I want you to notice that the word Islamophobe is not uh, a scholarly word. It's not a word that I, I actually don't respect or I lose respect for academics and scholars when they use this word because it's a term of propaganda. It's a term of rhetoric, uh, really, that is used to discredit someone or to um, uh, tar them. It is another word that is uh, in fact, a um, an ad hominem word. It's it's used 
to apply to people that you don't want other people to listen to. This word today is typically applied to people who anybody can be applied and can have this word applied to them. Whether somebody is critical of uh, Islam or uh, nobody wants to be around people who are unkind to other human beings just because of what they believe or, or where they come from or what they look like or anything like that. So I never endorse that sort of thing. But notice that Islam is not a, it's not an ethnicity. It's not a um, nation of origin or anything like that. It is a, um, a system of beliefs. And so to place any criticism of a belief system off limits and to say that not speaking well of it or indeed, you know, speaking ill of it is is somehow bad or reprehensible or what's the word repugnant as <laughs> the word that uh, Yasser Qadi uses here is uh, really actually it's being protective of something and it's placing uh, limits on it. so you can you can criticize anything else but you can't criticize this and so beyond being a term of rhetoric I think it's also a term of cowardice look if somebody wants to criticize me or anything that I believe come and you know let's have the conversation so that should be the case for anyone. And uh, being an American, uh, independent-minded, spirit American as I am, uh, I'm also very aware of the importance of freedom of conscience. And freedom of conscience is expressed um, in freedom of speech. And if you don't have freedom of speech, you do not have freedom of conscience. And freedom of religion goes along with that. And so these things are very, very important. And so I guard them zealously. Not for myself so much. I think I'm okay, but I think that everybody needs to have an environment in which uh, you can be free to think, and you can't be free to think if you're not free to speak. Uh, words are the vehicles through which we express meaning, and so this is just very important. So anyway, uh, that's a, another long roundabout way of saying I reject the term Islamophobe and Islamophobia. Now, Christian apologists... Um, Okay, uh, he says lack both genuine knowledge and integrity, and I assume he has uh, some uh, uh, legitimate criticism of knowledge, and he probably does have more um, advanced knowledge in um, certain aspects of uh, what uh, the other, um, of what uh, Jay or David, because Yasser Qadi has an area of specialization. And uh, he's a native, as I understand it, he's a native uh, speaker of Arabic, uh, appears to be very fluent in sources and so forth. And so it would not be at all surprising if he had a deeper level of knowledge on some of these things than uh, David Cook, David, uh, sorry, my advisor, David Cook, uh, David Wood, or uh, Jay Smith, or myself, indeed. And uh, I don't think anyone would uh, be surprised at that because we all have our particular areas of specialization. And so lacking genuine knowledge, well, lacking that genuine knowledge means you don't have any genuine knowledge, which I would be surprised if that was the case with uh, either of those guys or myself. Um, by the way, I do know that both of them have their doctorates as well in uh, different areas. And uh, you don't get to a point of that no matter how you uh, how you uh, present yourself to the world, you don't get to a point of having a uh, having a doctorate without having some knowledge and having some ability to work with uh, ideas and and uh, read a whole bunch and um, you know and defend your ideas to to a committee. So that has happened with uh, with those guys. Um, and I'm not here to defend them. I just I'm just telling you what I happen to know. Um, about them. And I understand you can't control who reads your works, but in your case, there is direct cooperation, as we all know, and your own personal beliefs and story as well are known. Well, of course, I've been very open in the world. I'm fairly public in my uh, presentation to the world, and I think I'm pretty much an open book. So um, that that's uh, that's what it is. I, I think that's a good way to live. It's a lot, a lot less stressful way to live. Well, I guess it, go, it relates to personality as well, whether you're a private person or a, or a public and open person. I always thought I was kind of an in, introvert as a kid, but uh, but I think more as I get older, I, I seem to be a much more uh, open person, although I do like to spend a lot of time alone with the book. So maybe that's true of some of you as well. Um, Okay, so I am spoon feeding, I suppose, and uh, he says then further down that there's direct cooperation. And as I said, I'm interviews. I haven't given an interview to uh, to David Wood uh, yet, um, and he hasn't asked me. Although I think it would be uh, possible if we ever did something, wanted to do something like that. But uh, by the way, you know, a, a number of these people have I've 
spent time with them and a number of other people have spent time with. As you know, Asma Halali is a friend. Asma has not been to our home yet. Uh, Emran al Badawi, the current um, uh, executive director of uh, ICSA, is, has been in our home. Um, uh, indeed, Haitham Sidki has been a guest in our home. Um, uh, Thomas Milo, uh, many of these other people. Like Garrett Poin, as you know, um, I, I am involved in this world and I'm friends with almost everybody who's uh, involved in this world, in this uh, circle of study. And so it should not be surprising that I would be uh, in conversation and associated with many people. Now, there are a lot of people who uh, will uh, sort of cordon themselves off and place themselves off limits from conversations and discussions with uh, those with whom they disagree or who are ideologically different from them. Uh, I'm not that sort of person. I will have uh, conversations. I may not have a conversation on camera with uh, uh, with people that I, I, the main thing is I want to know that people are honest and they're not going to do a sort of gotcha moments with you and uh, try to uh, try to make you look foolish on, on camera. But uh, aside from that, I will um, have conversations with uh, with pretty much anyone. I am open to the world and I'm here uh, living this life. And it's, I think, really important to be in discussion with people of all different kinds of opinions, points of view, backgrounds, and so forth. And so I do value that. It's one reason I'm so grateful to have been able to travel to um, all the places that I have around the world. Um, oh, I don't know, more than 40 countries now, but uh, including in my uh, research uh, you know, to places like Kuwait and Egypt and uh, Bahrain uh, several times, uh, Jordan, Lebanon, um, Uzbekistan, uh, Russia and uh, Turkey and, and many other places. And so this is all very good. This is a, this is good. This is the world that we live in. So let's continue on here. Um, and my personal beliefs and story are well known. Yeah. Okay. Anyone who conflates personal theological agendas with genuine scholarship eventually fails in both arenas. I'm not really sure that that's true, but I'm not sure that that's what I'm... I, I, I don't know what uh, Yasser Qadi actually means. He appears to be uh, applying that to me, theological agendas with genuine scholarship, aside from the conflict of interest, you know, the idea that you do have a bias, you have to recognize your biases and sort of try to work around them and make sure that you're not allowing them to influence your, um, your conclusions. But you're going to be cross-examined by people, you know, when you make a conclusion in a paper or in a book, um, you know, peer review is going to, is going to bring that out. Um, people are going to challenge you and either it'll stand up or it, it won't stand up, or it'll be an inconclusive, um, uh, outcome. But having a theological, um, apply, uh, um, having a, uh, let's see how we say this, bringing theology, and it's not what I'm doing, by the way, but I, I just want to, for the sake of the, um, of uh, what Yasser Qadi is mentioning here, um, number one, I just want to point out that I, <laughs> I think this, uh, probably this um, allegation or accusation could be, uh, could be turned back uh, toward him to a certain extent. But I don't think it's a bad thing to bring theology into, um, into a conversation and think about theology in, in as much of a reason, reasoned and scientific way as possible. And so agendas, yeah, okay, so if you come with a, I think the word agenda, what, what you get at with that word is the, um, is the idea that you have a um, pre-commitment and, and that is not a good thing. If you, well, it's not, to, to, when, when you come to try to make conclusions and to do thinking about, um, uh, about ultimate concerns, which is what we're talking about uh, here when we talk about theology, um, you want to come with, I don't really like the word open mind because open mind means, uh, not coming to, to conclusions. But if you have an open mind at the beginning of, a, of an investigation, it's actually a good thing because you wanna consider all the data and you wanna consider it in as reasonable a way as possible. Now to come to the end of an investigation and to still have an open mind when you've already sort of, uh, the evidence has pointed toward ruling out certain conclusions would be, um, I would say an irresponsible thing. So all of us have been kind of down a road I assume Yasser Qadi has been down a road. I've been down a road of uh, investigation and thinking about these things over the course of um, my life. And so it's reasonable to have some at least tentative conclusions that we've come to. 
So, um, yeah, but I, I, depending on what he means by agendas, I would either agree with that statement or I would push back on it slightly. All right, and the last thing he says is, as I said, I have nothing personal against you, and if we ever meet, you will not find me impolite or rude, but I can't respect a person who uses the academy to pursue an agenda of conversion or proselytization. All right, well, I mean, these are, again, sort of heavy, um, heavy allegations. I mean, if you put the word purpose in there, and, you know, the purpose of the pursuit of truth and the dealing with the things that are important in life, I, I don't think that's at odds with uh, the work of the academy, but I, I don't at all think that's the case. But then again, I don't, uh, I don't see my work as being uh, an agenda of conversion or and proselytization, although it's something that I, you know, that I do care about as a Christian. That that is part and parcel of being a Christian. You have to be about that, and every Christian is supposed to be uh, about that business. Um, it is an honest thing, and I don't think any of us want to be dishonest in our lives. And so I'm open to being persuaded of um, positions that are different from my own, and I think that's a way that uh, everybody should be because none of us wants to. I hope none of us wants to spend our lives believing something that's not true. So, um, yeah, so that uh, probably brings that to a conclusion, his um, response to me. And that's a very, very detailed and long uh, reply to his response. But here's what I wrote back to him. I wrote, your, Dear Yasser, your characterization of my work and of the worthiness of my research focus is interesting to me. I cannot, of course, require you to hold it or me in high regard, nor, I wrote not, but it should be nor, nor is such my particular concern. There is more to be said, and it might warrant further conversation at some point. If I have spare moments in coming days, I may send you additional reflections. At the moment, I won't, but to acknowledge your reply. All right, so I think that should uh, that should make sense, and I'll just wrap up this uh, rather long video at this point, and uh, thank you for watching. I'm going to try to get back to some more substantive stuff. Just so you know, uh, as an update, I'm working hard right now to finish my uh, book that I've been promising you for so long, and so I'm going to try. These videos are, are um, sort of this ongoing uh, weight on my shoulders that I have to do week after week, and I want to, I want to keep up with you, um, but I just want you to know that I'm working on some other uh, important things at the moment as well that you will really enjoy and appreciate once they uh, come to light. So thank you very much for watching. Please be sure to like and subscribe and to leave comments below. And um, we will respond to some of those as time goes on as well as we add new material uh, for your, um, for your uh, information. All right. Well, thanks so much. Talk to you soon. Bye.